we'll bring the uh, committee to order before I make an opening statement. Um, and and the, the witnesses on the first panel, uh, please be seated. But um, uh, before I make an opening statement, I have to tell you that I'm in my fifth day of what they call monocular vision. That's where my, uh, my optometrist finally convinced me that I should try putting a contact lens in one eye and, uh, and then get my other eye to, uh, to adjust to a distance. But right now there's a fight between which eye is winning. So uh, I had to get my staff to print the uh, text a little bit larger so I could make sure that I could uh, go through the statement. But if you see me walking around in circles, you also know why. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for being here. I especially want to welcome some uh, folks who uh, will be speaking um, uh, from North Carolina. And before we get started, the Personnel Subcommittee of the Senate Armed Services Committee meets this morning to receive testimony from government and civilian witnesses on traumatic brain injury, or TBI. TBI occurs along a continuum ranging from mild TBI or a concussion to severe and penetrating brain injury. While treatment for TBI varies with the severity of the injury, management of mild TBI includes treatment of symptoms such as headaches, memory problems, dizziness, and poor concentration, followed by a slow return to normal activity. From 2000 through the first half of 2017, the Department of Defense diagnosed over 370,000 service members with TBI. Of that total number of diagnoses, over 305,000 were mild TBIs. We know, however, that mild TBI is not a unique problem within the Department of Defense. It is a national problem. Last year, there were about 2.5 million emergency room visits related to concussions in the United States. And medical experts believe there were many more concussed individuals who did not seek medical care. As a nation, we must pursue multiple approaches to understand better the chronic effects of mild TBI, including the long-term neurodegenerative problems associated with multiple concussive injuries. Today, we are fortunate to have a very distinguished group of witnesses joining us to discuss the diagnosis and treatment of mild TBI and to learn more about ongoing research on the effects of concussion on the brain. On our first witness panel, we have Dr. David Dodick, Professor of Neurology, Sports Neurology, and Concussion Program Director at Mayo Clinic. Steve DeVick, CEO of King DeVick Technologies, DeVick, not DeVick, um, and Mr. Chris Miles, Medical Director of Athletics and Associate Director of Sports Medicine Fellowship, Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And uh, Mr. Miles, I already warned you that I want to welcome you because I have great regard for the academic programs at, uh, at Wake. I have no regard whatsoever for your football program. <laughs> With that stipulated, welcome to the, to the committee. Ranking Member Gillibrand. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and for really shining a spotlight on something that is so important to both of us and to the entire military. Um, I join you in welcoming our witnesses today to discuss uh, traumatic brain injury and the associated medical conditions. I'm pleased that we have a, a variety of, uh, of witnesses from different expertise inside and outside the government to discuss the current status of public and private advancements in diagnosis and treatment of TBI. This is a very important topic, not only for the military, but for society at large. Every parent of a high school athlete worries about his or her son uh, or daughter suffering a concussion, another word for mild TBI and the long-term potential consequences of this injury. What we learn stu while studying TBI in the military may also apply to the treatment of their concussive injuries. Certainly we owe, um, we owe state of the art care to our service members who incur a traumatic brain injury as a result of their military duties. That is what this hearing is all about, but it's more than that. Accurately diagnosing TBI is complicated by symptoms that overlap with post-traumatic stress disorder, such as difficulty in concentrating, irritability or angry outbursts, and memory loss. TBI and PTSD are commonly referred to as the signature wounds of war in our recent conflicts. Indeed, these wounds of, wounds of war Indeed, these are wounds of war, but there are other related wounds that also deserve more attention. We know that anxiety disorders, acute stress, sleep disorders, depression, substance use disorders, chronic pain, and other health conditions are also consequences of military service. Reports indicate that there have been more than 370,000 service members diagnosed with TBI from 2000 to 2017. 
At the same time, the Centers for Disease Control estimate that there are 2.8 million TBI-related emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths a year. The damage is not limited to the traumatic brain injury itself. Based on VA data, we know that veterans with a history of TBI are at higher risk for suicide, and other data shows an increase in diagnosis of dementia and Alzheimer's disease and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, commonly referred to as CTE, for those who have suffered a concussion traumatic brain injury. I am very concerned that service members uh, suffering from TBI, PTSD, and other service-connected conditions are too frequently disciplined and discharged with a bad paper discharge for actions that are manifestations of these injuries. Service members suffering from moderate or severe TBI can incur a lifetime of physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral challenges. These challenges can manifest as drug and alcohol-related misconduct, aggressive actions charged as a assaults, AWOLs, and failures to follow orders. These bad paper discharges are too often a consequence of suffering from military-induced conditions and result in the veterans not being eligible for the care for these conditions from the VA. Military leaders must do a better job in taking these medical conditions into account when service members are merely exhibiting the symptoms of their service-related injuries. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Uh, gentlemen, each of you will just start from my uh, left and go across, and you can spend up to maybe about five minutes on opening comments. Well, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, it's a, uh, and distinguished members of the uh, panel, it's an indeed a pr privilege and honor to have this opportunity to appear, to appear before you today and provide a testimony uh, for this hearing on brain injuries and in military service members. As was said, I'm a professor of neurology. Uh, and founder and director of the concussion program at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. I've been involved in the evaluation and management of patients with concussion for over 21 years, and I currently oversee the clinical and research concussion programs at Mayo Clinic, uh, several of which are funded by the Department of Defense and the National Institutes of Health. I'm the chair of the American Academy of Neurology's Concussion Committee, and I co-direct their annual sports concussion conference, and I'm also the president-elect of the International Concussion Society and co-founder of concussion.org. So we'll start with what is a concussion. A concussion is often referred to as a head injury, but it's not synonymous with a head injury. It's instead an injury to the brain itself. This injury involves individual cells in the brain and the wiring that connects them. There is both a primary and a secondary injury to the brain that results in dysfunction, disruption, and likely even death of living cells and their living connections. The primary injury occurs from the direct impact of the blunt force of the rapid, or the rapid movement of the brain within the skull. But the secondary brain injury occurs because of an inflammatory response that occurs and the inability of stunned and sick cells uh, to generate the energy required for their repair. These primary and secondary injuries result in a breakdown of the normal electrical and chemical communication between cells. And it's this disruption of this extensive and interconnected communication grid uh, that affects many sites in the brain and leads to the varied symptoms several of which you've already highlighted today, including physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms that have a, an enormous impact on the individual, a very devastating one, uh, and <clears throat> actually affects the ability to function in daily life at work, at home, or in school. So why is concussion a military and a public health priority? I think concussion by any measure um, is a health priority. It's very common, obviously. It can lead to permanent symptoms in some and progressive neurological disease in others, and yet, as was alluded to, remain significantly underdiagnosed. For U.S. forces deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq in Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation New Dawn, blast exposure was the leading cause of concussion. Blast injury is the res re results in the rapid transmission of an acoustic wave through the brain tissue. Over the last 16 years, an estimated 320,000 U.S. troops, about one in five, returning from active theater, has sustained a concussion. And among those, almost half experienced symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress or post-concussion syndrome. Therefore, not surprisingly, there's a heavy personal, family, and financial cost of these injuries to our men and women in uniform. The cost of care alone has increased from 21 million in 2003 to over 650 million in 2010. And the median health care cost for veterans with traumatic brain injury is four times higher than those for veterans who do not experience traumatic brain injury. Among civilians, nearly four million concussions occur every year. And among these, sport-related concussion has obviously received the most media and public attention. While there are several reasons for this, chief among them 
I think, is the devastating long-term neurological consequences that have been demonstrated in amateur and professional athletes who participate in contact sport. And this should be of particular concern to all of us because there are over 46 million children and adolescents in the United States who participate in sport, and they, in particular, are uniquely vulnerable to the complications of concussion because of the effects of brain injury on a developing brain that hasn't fully matured. Another vulnerable population that's often not talked about is women. Approximately 20 million women experience a domestic violence-related traumatic brain injury in this country every year. A recent study by the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence revealed that 92% of the women in domestic violence shelters were hit in the head by their partners more than once, and almost one in 10 were hit more than 20 times in the past year. Concussions under-recognized, as I said, and while the reported number of concussions in this, in this country is staggering, the actual number is much higher. It's estimated that only one in six concussions, especially in sport-related concussions, are recognized and diagnosed. Um, and this is due to a lot of different reasons, which, which I'll get to. Uh, one major reason for the lack of recognition of a concussive brain injury is the lack of symptoms. Just as brain injury from silent strokes and other silent lesions that can occur in the brain, so too can silent concussions occur. And these so-called subconcussive hits have been demonstrated to be far more frequent uh, than actual concussions themselves, especially in contact sport athletes. These subconcussive injuries are especially important because the cumulative effect of subconcussive impacts results in a loss of the brain's normal architecture and neurological and psychiatric consequences later in life. Much of the research on subconcussive hits has been performed in athletes involved in contact sports. And if you look at many of these studies, uh, some of which I've outlined in the testimony, you will see that even in individuals who haven't experienced a concussion, there's a loss of normal brain function uh, in those individuals, both at a youth level as well as at a collegiate and professional level. So these and other similar studies indicate that concussion is really the tip of the iceberg, while subconcussive hits represents a larger hidden danger that results in injury to the brain and lingering effects that are not being detected by current concussion assessment techniques. While the majority of individuals, as was said, experience symptom resolution from a single concussion within a week or two, post-concussion syndrome, or the persistence of symptoms beyond four weeks, occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of individuals after a single concussion. In children and adolescents, the percentage who experience persistent symptoms beyond one month has been shown to be at least 30 percent. Individuals who experience persistent symptoms may become functionally impaired or indeed permanently disabled. In addition to post-concussion syndrome, repeated concussions and subconcussive hits can lead to permanent cognitive and psychiatric impairment, a syndrome known as traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. In individuals with traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, symptoms persist for longer than two years and progress over time. The symptoms and signs of TES, or traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, are similar to those seen in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. And as many of us know, CTE is a progressive degenerative brain disease that's been demonstrated to occur in individuals with a history of exposure to repeated head injuries. Unfortunately, and this is something maybe we'll get into, at this time we don't yet know how to identify people who are at risk of developing CTE, um, nor do we have yet have a reliable method to diagnose the disease before death or to intervene with treatment that prevents or disrupts the progression of the disease. I'll end with the challenge that we as clinicians taking care of these patients face. The diagnosis, I think, of concussion is challenging even for experts. The reasons for this are several. First of all, the many of the symptoms are subjective. They have to be reported by the athlete or the individual, and many times they're not. Or the symptoms, as I said, may be absent. They may have had a subconcussive hit or a silent concussion or brain injury. A lot of times the visible signs may not be present. Even for those of us who have been examining patients for over 20 years, the signs can be so subtle that they're not picked up on the routine bedside neurological examination. And finally, the detection of concussion often requires objective and quantitative tests that are not part of the routine neurological examination. Even when the diagnosis of concussion is made, the challenging of managing the patient is difficult because there are no pharmacological agents, not a single one, that has been shown to be effective in improving symptoms or interrupting that secondary injury cascade that occurs that I alluded to earlier. Another challenge for the clinician is knowing when the brain injury has stabilized. It's been well demonstrated now 
that the brain injury continues and is not fully recovered long after the symptoms have resolved. So we're lulled into a sense of complacency, thinking that the examination is normal, the symptoms have resolved, and so that individual is ready to return to duty or ready to return to play, and that simply is not the case in many individuals. And it's during this window of time where the brain is uniquely vulnerable to repeat injury that may result in symptoms that persist or, may, or, or more serious may result in permanent injury. So determining if and when this window of vulnerability has closed is very challenging without expensive brain imaging that is not widely available, not feasible on a large scale basis, and still not validated as a reliable clinical tool that can be used on an individual basis. So what is needed? Well, given the challenges in diagnosis, treatment, and ability to provide patients with a prognosis, I think there's an urgent need for objective, widely available, and cost-effective tests that do the following. Rapidly and accurately identifies when a concussion has occurred, allowing for the removal of that individual from the, from the uh, activities that place them at further risk. Indicate when it's safe for an individual to return to their previous activities, and this will avoid exposing an individual to a repeat and potentially devastating injury. Predict who is most vulnerable to repeat concussions. And predict who is at risk of long-term symptoms and chronic neurological impairment from repeated concussions and subconcussive impacts. We also need tests that accurately diagnose traumatic encephalopathy syndrome and chronic traumatic encephalopathy so that treatments, when developed, and I'm optimistic they're coming, can prevent the progression or at least ameliorate the symptoms of these diseases. There's also, in addition to the diagnostic tests that are necessary, there's a serious need for treatments, treatments that can prevent these second injury cascades that are set in motion with that primary impact to the brain, because I think it's these second injury cascades that can persist for days, weeks, or longer that result in the progressive brain damage that occurs and likely results in the persistence of symptoms that these individuals uh, experience. I also think there's a need for treatments that facilitates the brain's ability to repair, adapt, and compensate for previous injury, to prevent the development of chronic neurodegenerative diseases, and to interfere with the progression of those diseases when they've already begun. Until this occurs, I think we need to implement validated examination techniques that are sensitive for the detection of concussion immediately. I am confident in the dedication and commitment of the scientists and clinicians involved in this field, several of whom are in this room, and I'm optimistic that the scientific and treatment advances will be realized for the, benefits, for the benefit of millions of men, women, and children affected by concussion. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you again for this opportunity and for your precious time and attention. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Devick. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Gillibrand, and distinguished members of the committee, it's a high honor for me to appear before you today. I'm the CEO of King Devick Technologies. We develop objective physical electronically transmittable tests of eyes and brain function, which are validated in peer-reviewed medical journals and are able to be administered by laypersons. Before beginning, I'd like to recognize Treg Doris and his right there. Treg is the son of NFL two-time Super Bowl winner Dave Doris and of the Chicago Bears and New York Giants. Dave was a friend of mine. He was a brilliant scholar-athlete who graduated with honors from Notre Dame and later took his own life at 50 years old by shooting himself in the chest so that his brain could be evaluated because he was fairly certain he had chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He did indeed have an advanced case of CTE, although was diagnosed with very few concussions in his career. Treg is... Pardon me? Oh. If the light's red, it's on. Okay. Um, should I just get closer? It's on. Anyway. Okay. Uh, Treg's a, a highly successful businessman now, and he's also a Notre Dame athlete. Um, his dad was uh, drafted by the uh, Montreal uh, baseball franchise, too. Uh, Treg's often said if he played baseball, he'd probably be still alive today. But anyway, he's dedicated his life to uh, doing something about the CTE, which is just a prevalent problem, and we've called to attention again this week when, you know, with the NFL had an issue with the diagnosis on the sidelines. As far as our products are concerned, in a DOD NCAA-funded study published in November 2017, in a peer-reviewed journal, it was found that King Devic test was shown to have the highest test retest reliability when compared with more than a dozen other con concussion tests. This article was authored by members of the CARE Consortium, the NCAA, and the Department of Defense. And in May of 2017, uh, 
King Divic Technologies was one of the group of participants ranging from the federal government representatives, private industry, professional medical research, and veterans communities invited to compete in the VA's annual Brain Trust Innovation Summit. Uh, King Divic Technologies is a winner of the 2017 Innovation Awards for its brain injury remediation and rehabilitation applications utilizing technology that allows for faster recovery from TBI and from concussions as well. Um, in the, because the diagnosis of MTBI concussions in service members and everyone often relies on history alone, the DODVA uh, clinical practice guidelines indicate that a conformatory objective test for concussions that could be used to direct support and or predict outcomes would be desirable. And in 2016, a group of military officers who are doctors uh, identified King Divic test as the solution, as a solution. We rec the quote from their article was, we recommend the King Divic test be utilized as a supplementary screening tool in those who have suffered a concussive event having pre-injury King, King Divic test data will allow more precise determination. Therefore, we recommend the test be included as a baseline for all warfighters prior to exposure to risk of MTBI. Having a validated, rapid, easy to access brain screening test can assist frontline providers in making return to duty decisions. And in 2000, since 2011, more than 110 peer-reviewed articles have been published in elite medical journals validating these King Divic applications. These, these articles uh, describe the, the products as clinical biomarkers, not serum uh, biomarkers, um, and other aspects of the test uh, helped in uh, re remove from play decisions. And the effectiveness of this product is concussion Detection led to its co-branding with the Mayo Clinic, the first co-branding agreement ever entered, in, uh, ever entered into throughout Mayo Clinic's 150-year history. The test, now known as the King Divic test in association with Mayo Clinic, is the most validated sideline screening tool for concussions currently available. Changes in performance can easily be transmitted to inform diagnostic and related clinical service provision and guide clinical decision making from theater to medical treatment facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Miles, I should say that my senior member from, uh, uh, from North Carolina probably has a decidedly different view of the AWAKE uh, program, so you got some balance <laughs> there in the delegation. You can provide your opening statement. Very good, sir. Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member, member Jill Brand, and honorable members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss concussion from an academic clinician's perspective. I currently serve as the Medical Director of Athletics and the Head Team Physician for Wake Forest University, the Associate Director of the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship at the School of Medicine, and the Site Principal Investigator for the NCAA and Department of Defense Sponsored Care Consortium Research Study. As a former college football player who has experienced concussion, I've seen all sides of this condition. Unlike many medical diagnoses, concussion is not yet well understood. This enigmatic condition not only has different presentations, causes, and outcomes from patients, but it also has very little evidence-based guided evaluation and management options, though research is changing this. Much of the management recommendations for sport-related concussion have been driven by consistent statements released over the last decade. The most recent release of this came in 2017 as the result of the fifth international conference on concussion in sport. Although the conference makes a distinction between sport-related concussion and non-sport-related concussion, many of the key principles are shared between these two entities. I have been fortunate to be part of several different research studies investigating the natural history of the condition, evaluation tools, and management options. The largest and most well-known of these is the NCAA DOD care study. As part of the Grand Alliance, the CARE study is designed to answer scientific questions about the course and neurobiology of concussion in a definitive way. With 30 sites, including the four military academies, over 37,000 athletes and cadets have been enrolled, and over 2,500 concussive events have been captured and studied. This is nearly 100 times the number of subjects in the average concussion study. Through this study, the NCAA and DOD Grand Alliance is setting the standard for concussion research and clinical care. The collaboration between the universities and the military academies has provided data that is absolutely unprecedented. Although it has been just over three years since its inception, this consortium has impacted the, the practice of concussion management in several ways. 
perhaps most important to this committee, is the finding that historically there have been some undue delays in the return to duty of non-athlete cadets. This finding has changed management of concussion at the academies. Unfortunately, the consortium is at a watershed moment. Funding for continuation of this highly important research has expired. An application for CARE 2.0, a study to further our knowledge, especially in areas of neurobiology and long-term outcomes, was declined by the Department of Defense. The NCAA has agreed in principle to supporting the CARE 2.0 initiative, but funding from the DOD has not yet been secured. It is my hope that this committee sees the benefit in continuing this highly important work. In addition to the work with the CARE study, our group at Wake Forest is involved in force sensor research through helmet and mouthpiece sensors, post-concussive biomarker data, and the role of genetics in post-concussive syndrome. We are also particularly active with the study of concussions in youth football. Also being studied are blood and saliva tests to determine if we can predict which patient will have prolonged symptoms and brain imaging techniques that may provide similar predictability information. These types of studies are vitally important as clinically no two concussions are created equal. It is crucial that we develop an objective test that will help diagnose and guide the management of this condition. There are current tools, such as the King Devic, but there is no, not yet a gold standard for concussion testing. If an imaging or blood test similar to what we have for evaluating heart attacks were to be discovered, the evaluation and management could be standardized. Perhaps of equal importance, if we were able to identify a gene that may predispose patients to the long-term sequelae of concussion, we could counsel those patients on avoiding potentially higher risk activities. We are still too early in the study process of biomarkers, imaging, and gene identification to include them in clinical decision making. More research funding will help to determine if these advances are in fact predictive, and if so, which ones do this the best. I believe the importance of the collaboration between military and civilian clinicians and researchers in tackling the best way to diagnose and treat concussions is crucial. Although the causes of injuries may be different, though certainly not always, the importance of being able to accurately diagnose and provide the best treatments is the same. When a condition does not have an objective test that cannot be manipulated, there is always the risk that symptoms may be feigned. A student or soldier that wants to avoid an activity could falsely report symptoms. A truly objective test will assist in guide not, guiding not only diagnosing diagnosis of actual concussion injuries, but will allow for a more rapid return to learning and activity in those who would not test positive. Many entities have helped raise awareness of concussion to our society at large. We are likely more educated on the prevention and identification of concussion than ever before. Most athletes and military personnel recognize the importance of this topic for their safety and well-being. However, there is still great work to be done. We must make activities safer and less of a burden on long-term health and the healthcare system. Researchers and clinicians must continue to grow the data needed to make evidence-based recommendations, and funding bodies must continue to make this topic a priority. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you all. I, uh, I have a, a question for Dr. DeVick. The, uh, can you give me an idea of the cost, the timing of the test, and where these tests can be administered? Did you say the cost? Yep. Oh, the cost is uh, less than $20 per year per individual for under unlimited testing. So there's very little cost involved. And when is the test administered after you after somebody's experienced an injury that you're testing for? Well, it's or is a, it something you do on a recurring basis to a larger population? Well, it's a si the sideline application that we're partners with Mayo Clinic on is a at the point of sidelines immediately after the concussion occurs. Uh, is this the sort of a test that could be uh, uh, reliably administered in a battlefield situation? Yes, as a matter of fact, it's you know hundreds, actually thousands of teams and leagues around the world use King Divic tests, and they do it on a noising. Like a, in, the NFL doesn't use it yet, but I think they'll get there. The Canadian Football League does all of the the administration can be done on the sidelines where there's noise and whatever else goes on on the sidelines. So it's just a two-minute test that checks your ability to move your eyes. And, what and are the other alternative uh, tests? Give me some idea of uh, what that they would, I would guess they would be competing against a, a test that's obviously gotten a lot of attention. Uh, 
But what are the other? What's the landscape look out there in terms look like out there in terms of options? Well, right now we it's kind of a three legged stool for sideline testing. One is ocular motor function, which is what our test is applies to, and one is balance, and then one is cognition, like who's the president, what day is it, those kind of questions. I think that when you apply all three of those, that can be done quickly on the sideline. You get very high specificity and sensitivity. Um, so as uh, Dr. Miles said, ours is a tool. There's other tools that they should be combined with, but again, the whole suite of tools doesn't take long and it can be done on the sidelines. Is there, is there any data out there with respect to false positives? I mean, is it highly accurate? Do we, do we sweep in that may not have suffered an injury? Well, the, the false positives we aren't nearly as concerned about as false negatives. Right. So uh, the specificity and the biggest meta-analysis ever done on our products out of, they combined 15 studies together and the sensitivity was 86% and the specificity was 90%, which is higher than anything like a pap smear or anything else and it's done on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, it's not 100%, but it's certainly a better indication and then asking the player how it how he feels. Okay, and and this this uh, anyone who has uh, information on it, um, the uh, what research has been done to uh, this actually speaks to something I'll spend more time with the second panel. But uh, we've uh, Senator Blumenthal and I and others on the Veterans Affairs Committee are worried about uh, PTS uh, and TBI that may have resulted in behavioral problems that ultimately precipitated an other than honorable discharge. So what research has been done to the, the population who experiences uh, a, a concussion or something on the spectrum of TBI uh, where there are measured behavioral differences in the person after that, that are virtually unrecoverable? Uh, they, they just become a part of who they are, in this case, the soldier, and anyone who has any information on that, I'd like to hear it. Well, there's uh, uh, the DARPA a DOD uh, VA study just done by uh, Dr. Shear um, found that with comorbidity, that is what you described, where there's a PTSD or something else in addition to a concussion, she found in this in this article that's pending publication that Dr. Dodick may know more about than I, that when there's comorbidity, the defect on your oculomotor test on King Devic test Dr. lasted Dodick for years. Or, or Dr. Miles. So part of the care consortium study is looking at behavioral changes um, in, in long term, both both acutely and in the long term setting. Um, there is some speculation and, and I think some data to support that pre-morbid uh, conditions such as depression, anxiety, those sorts of things may also play into some of the behavioral changes that occur post-concussively. Thank you. Dr. Dodi. Yeah, I would say there's actually been quite a bit of work, especially imaging work that's been done in some of these individuals. And so what they found, first of all, is actually in the temporal lobe, which is sometimes referred to as the limbic lobe, where many of the structures in the brain are housed that govern and control emotional function, is altered. Its architecture is altered after a concussive brain injury, such that I saw a recent study indicating that the amygdala, which is... Uh, part of the brain that drives the fear response, part of the brain that's responsible for impulsivity, aggress aggressive behavior, is actually enlarged after a concussive brain injury. While other areas in the temporal lobe, such as the hippocampus, for example, which is what allows us to remember what we're being told, actually shrinks over time. So, so if, unless you, if you, are you able to determine a change without having a reference point, let's say a, 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 an image of the brain prior to the event? Yeah, very good question. So. Not exactly, but the studies that I'm talking about compared to age and sex matched or age and gender matched controls, right? Yeah. Obviously, it would be ideal to have a, a pre-injury MRI scan on all these individuals, right. but that's not feasible or practical. So it ends up being compared, and it's within the 95% confidence interval uh, of change in that individual. So there's a variety of imaging studies. There's also some molecular studies that have been done showing, you know, an upregulation in something called a corticotropin receptor, which is um, measured, which is a sensitive surrogate marker of the stress response. So there are both physiological, biological, and imaging um, changes that occur in individuals who exhibit this impulsive, aggressive behavior after a tra traumatic brain injury. Very good. Thank you all. Ranking member Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while the symptoms of TBI may appear right away, others may not be noticed for days or months after injury or until a person resumes everyday activities. 
In some cases, service members do not recognize or admit that they are having problems or understand the problem of or and how the symptoms they're experiencing impact their daily activities. Are you looking at delayed onset? <laughs> Excuse me. Are you looking at delayed onset TBI in your research? So absolutely. One of the uh, nice pieces of the CARE study is the data points currently um, during symptom stage, uh, in the asymptomatic stage, once they've returned, and then again at, at the six-month follow-up. The hope uh, with CARE 2.0 is to continue that out for many years um, to see uh, if there is potentially behavioral changes, uh, mood changes, et cetera, uh, that may occur. And, and so that, that's part of the reason why the funding is so important um, is so that we can complete that, that, that part of the study. And do you think it's getting um, enough research? And do you think there's any way we can integrate awareness of delayed onset into policies and procedures at the DOD and VA? I think just simply, as you mentioned, that it's out there and, and we should be aware of it and, and educating not only physicians but um, commanders of units and those sorts of things. That's, that's certainly something that they should watch for. Uh, I alluded to the secondary injury cascades that are set in motion after the primary impact and I think it's these inflammatory cascades that are set in motion that continue for days, weeks, or even months that are responsible for some of the delayed onset symptoms and signs that, that you're talking about. Mm. We and others are doing preclinical work in animal models showing what some of those changes are because what that does, it allows us to uh, sort of tee up high value targets for therapy. We're also doing some imaging work following patients prospectively over time to see some of the structural and functional changes in the brain that occur well after yeah, uh, the I mean, so, I've seen those images. They're remarkable. They're startling. We do some of it at um, locally, I think, at um, Walter Reed. Yeah. So I think there really needs to be a public awareness campaign. You know, we've seen the results of massive public awareness campaigns where individuals are educated about the signs and symptoms of stroke, for example, mm. because now we have all these clot-busting therapies, and we need patients to recognize them and get into the hospital as quickly as possible. We need the same sort of public awareness campaign around concussion. As mm. I said... 20 million women have suffered traumatic brain injury, 46 million kids um, exposed, you know, are, are in contact sport. I mean, it's a massive public health problem. We, and we need, to, we need a, a, a public awareness campaign that matches the importance of this problem. I agree, which is why I think if we can have the military be state of the art, we can then have a better conversation about sports and particularly kids in sports. I mean, I don't want my child playing football. Um, it would scare the heck out of me. Even soccer scares the heck out of me. I was glad when they finally said no headers until you're at least, I think, 13 or 14. But like, these are real issues. And I think if the military figures it out, then the rest of us can figure it out. And that's why it's so important. Um, a second question, based on your expertise and research into the diagnos diagnosis and treatment of TBI in the civilian population, um, what do you think the military and the VA can do to improve their approaches to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment? What ways can you guys influence the civilian world? Well, I'll start by just saying that, you know, I can only talk about what, what I can control in my own center. And, and in, that, in that control, I, we've implemented what we believe is an evidence-based, objective, and quantitative neurological assessment preseason. At least, I'm talking about sport athletes mm -hmm. now. Preseason and, and after injury, mm -hmm. and that's why I said earlier. I think it's really important that we at least use the tools that we have. While not perfect, they are objective, they are quantitative, and they are sensitive for detecting concussion. So I think an evidence-based approach needs to be implemented, and this field yeah. is evolving. Yeah. Every day, new research comes out, and it's incumbent upon us. Uh, on behalf of our patients to be able to adapt and evolve with it, with the, with the changing science. And do you think that the military and VA's approaches to diagnos diagnosis and treatment are effective methods for preventing the potential long-term consequences of the injury? Well, I'm not intimately familiar with the with the military concussion protocol, but again, I would just say that um, as science becomes available, I think that military uh, physicians civilian physicians, we all need to adapt and evolve with that. I think that, you know, there's new things available all the time. One of the things is uh, the ocular motor aspect that the military hasn't used much so far, but is being used in, in branches of the military, and of course balance and cognition um, are being used. So I think that uh, that package of three uh, 
evaluating tools is what is becoming more and more the state of the art in, uh, in at least in sports. Thank it you. really needs to be objective and quantitative because, you know, I've been examining patients for over 25 years. Yeah. And even to this day, when an individual comes in with a concussive brain injury, I have a hard time, I would have a hard time picking up on a bedside neurological examination deficits that I could hang my hat on and say, yes, this individual's had a brain injury. That's why I think the guesswork needs to be taken out of it. Uh, the subjectivity needs to be taken out of it. We have quantitative objective tools. We need to implement them now. And we need to continue the research and work hard to find better tools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Warren, before I recognize you, I want to thank you for your consistent participation in these subcommittee hearings. This is a very important one. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. And I apologize for running in. We're, I'm trying to cover another hearing at the I same time. I should also time. say there are a number of hearings yeah. happening at the same time. This is a very so, important subject. But this is really important, and I really do appreciate your holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. This is, this is uh, critical, and I thank all of you for being here today. Since 2000, more than 370,000 service members have received a first-time diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. It is one of the most common and least understood injuries that service members experience. And thanks to the work that you and others have done, we now understand that exposure to blast pressure can result in an impact-related concussion where the brain is damaged because it bangs around inside the skull. But we are also now coming to understand that the blast pressure wave can also cause harm by damaging the brain at the subcellular level. And while most people think of TBI as being the result of exposure to an IED explosion, on the battlefield, we're now learning that it is not the only or even the most common source of blast exposure for service members. So I was very glad to get an amendment into this year's defense bill that requires the Pentagon to begin a longitudinal study of the blast exposure that our service members experience on the battlefield and when firing larger weapons during training. Can I just ask you, Dr. Dodick, can you explain why tracking blast exposure over time is essential to helping us get a handle on this problem? Well, you know, I think a blast exposure traumatic brain injury is in some ways different than the kind of brain injury that one might experience on a football field or on an ice hockey uh, rink. Um, there is an acoustic wave, as I mentioned earlier, that travels through the brain at a very high velocity that at a microstructural level damages the tissues and disrupts the connections between cells, in addition to, as you say, rattling the brain around inside of its skull. So there are multiple mechanisms of injury that I think are distinct and unique, and I know that there are some um, research labs in the country looking specifically at um, the, ce the cellular level, at the cellular level, the injury cascades that are set in motion after an acoustic blast like that. So I do think the injury is different, and I think the work is ongoing right now to see whether or not, at the end of the day, does it really matter? Are the same cascades still set in motion? Is the initial impact injury from a blunt force to the head versus a, a blast injury, is that, is that the same? Right. Um, and how different are they? I, I, there's no question in my mind, as you allude to, that we, up until recently, we've always said concussion is a functional brain injury from which 90% of individuals recover fully. Well, that may not be the case, because even when you do an MRI scan, which is certainly more sophisticated and can see the brain at a finer detail than a CT scan, you may not see the injury until you peer at a microscopic level with special types of MRIs, and then you see these fiber tracks that are just completely disrupted, like you took a pair of scissors to them, that you don't see. Uh, on a routine MRI scan. So I agree with you completely. This, there's a lot happening at a cellular level, at a microstructural level that we can't pick up on routine clinical imaging. We definitely need more imaging research and we definitely need more basic research to understand um, whether or not these two injuries, the blunt force versus the acoustic blast, is similar in the damage to the brain that occurs as a result of them. Well, that's very helpful, and it looks like we're going to get this one passed into law. I also want to note, though, my amendment requires that the Pentagon consider 
the feasibility of a blast exposure log, you know, analogous to a service member's jump log for airborne operations. So let me ask about that one. Could data collection like this help ensure that blast exposure is fully documented so that service members get appropriate care if they later develop post-concussive symptoms. Dr. Miles, could I ask you to weigh in on that? Certainly, and, and I think that the, the idea behind the helmet sensor and mouthpiece sensor data that we're researching to determine can we get a sense of how many blows and at what force those blows are occurring, um, that same technology could certainly be applied to our service members. Um, the, Dr. Dodick had mentioned earlier the cumulative effect of sub-concussive blows and, and that, that same um, effect, whether that's because of blast injuries from using firearms or explosions in the field, um, although sub-concussive at the time, when added up, can lead to these same symptoms. And so I think the idea behind keeping track of the amount of force that the brain sees over a given time is a very good concept and, and may lead to a threshold identified that when a service member reaches that, you pull them out of, of the, um, their activity or, or whatever they're doing that's leading to those exposures. Well, thank you, Dr. Miles. That's a powerfully important point. You know, we all know that traumatic brain injury can have devastating lifelong consequences for our service members and our veterans, and I'm grateful for the work you're doing in this area. I hope you will let us know if there is more we can do. I have a question about protective equipment, but I'm already over my time. Is that all right, Mr. Chairman? Is that all right? Thank you, good. So I've got, I wanna to go to another area here. The Pentagon is at the forefront of research into equipment that protects the lives of our soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines. For example, I am very proud of the cutting edge research that the Natick Army Soldier Systems Center in Massachusetts is doing. Everything from improving body armor to preventing stress injuries. Natick is also at the cutting edge of helmet technology. And the research has shown that different helmet designs and shapes can change the way that blast pressure impacts the brain. But right now, most of the military helmets that we give to deploying soldiers are designed principally just to protect against bullets and other blunt injuries rather than blast injuries. So uh, Dr. Miles or Dr. Dodek, whoever would like to do this, what does the research tell us about the types of helmet modifications that might reduce pressure transmitted to the brain in a, in a blast? Who would like to go? Yeah. So, Dr. Miles? So I can speak to that in, in the uh, hockey helmet and football helmet. I can't speak to it in the, in the military helmet. Um, and so if that's okay. Well, let me just or, ask, Dr. Dodick, would you like to speak to it in the military context? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about the actual... Impact. Um, there's a lot of discussion on whether or not football helmets are able to be designed to decrease concussive risk. Um, and again, the injuries may not be the same, um, but it, it seems like a, a very important area of research uh, for the military. Um, if that can be designed and we can reduce the, the forces that the brain is seeing inside the skull, there's a great likelihood that you'll I would say, Senator Warren, that there's no evidence to date that any technology, helmet or otherwise, has actually been able to reduce the incidence of concussion. Because as you, as you said at very, uh, very early on, it's that movement of the brain uh, within the skull. It's almost like, I make the analogy, it's like an egg. It's like a yolk inside of an egg. And you shake it, you can break the yolk, but the egg looks, looks fine. Helmets have done a very good job at preventing skull fractures and preventing major ca catastrophic intracranial bleeding, for example, uh, but there's no evidence yet they've been able to reduce the incidence of concussion.
it starts with research, figure out what works and what doesn't work. So I hope this is an area where we are doing more and trying to determine what we can do to best protect uh, those who are in the field fighting for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, again, your having Thank you, here. Senator Warren. And uh, Senator Miles, I'm not going to ask other questions except request that our office get together, talk about the consortium, and see what we can do to uh, try and help. Because that, that really is a collaboration where it's not just DOD, it's private sector, everybody coming together. And I think that holistic approach is probably going to produce the best result. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate your time. We could have the uh, just brief transition. We'll bring up the second panel and a brief introduction and get to opening that statements. Panel. That was a very good. Thank you all. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and do a brief introduction and get right to the opening statements. I want to welcome the second panel, <clears throat> Captain and Dr. Michael Colston, Director of Military Health Policy and Oversight for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Department of Defense, Dr. Joel Shulton, Associate Chief of Staff for Rehabilitation Services for Veterans Affairs Medical Center, Washington, D.C., and David Sifu, Senior TBI Specialist and Principal Investigator, Chronic Effects of Neurotrauma Consortium, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, welcome all to the committee, and uh, we'll do a windshield wiper. We'll start from the right and go to left this time. Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Gillibrand, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Defense's efforts regarding traumatic brain injury. I'm honored to testify alongside my esteemed VA colleagues, uh, and I'd also like to thank you for your sustained leadership and support of our nation's service members, uh, families, and veterans, especially those dealing with complex issues around TBI. The department's approach to evaluation and treatment of TBI at the point of injury facilitates rapid identification and recovery, reducing the chance of another concussion before a service member is healed from a first. DOD's mandatory screening program promotes early identification of service members with concussion, ensuring effective treatment of physical, cognitive, and emotional effects of the injury. We know that after a brief period of rest, a concussed individual can begin a progressive return to activity. The vast majority of individuals who sustain a concussion improve clinically and don't have any sequelae. On the other hand, we see patients who continue to suffer. In my practice as a psychiatrist, I've seen a number of TBI patients with comorbidities, such as adjustment disorders, pain, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and substance use disorders. So in short, we find that TBI is a protean disorder that can present with a wide range of cognitive, behavioral, and physical deficits. But we need to meet patients where they are on the road to recovery. So DOD remains focused on hard problems around diagnostic clarification because we need to get return to duty determinations, administrative dispositions, and medical disability findings right. DOD conducts state of the science research as part of the National Research Action Plan, which coordinates our research priorities with VA and NIH. DOD also collaborates in the national effort to characterize degenerative conditions stemming from subconcussive events or blast exposures. The Army STARS studies characterizing TBI's possible contribution to our suicide problem. An interaction between mental health and TBI research portfolios lets us know what we know so we can rehabilitate more service members who present with complex symptoms. As we look to the future of TBI research, we appreciate that the human brain represents the most complex organization of living structure in all of biology. Our investments will pay returns. With your continued support, I'm confident that our research discoveries, clinical innovations, and focus on readiness will bear fruit, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sifu. I defer to my colleague, Dr. Skelton. Good morning, Chairman, Chairman Tillis, Ranking Member Gillibrand, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss traumatic brain injuries, or TBI. I'm accompanied today by Dr. David Seafew, my colleague who is the Senior TBI Specialist for VHA. 
VA's TBI Polytrauma Program delivers world-class rehabilitation services for veterans and service members. Through this program, VA continues to advance the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of TBI. TBI severity is determined at the time of injury and is based on the individual's ability to respond to the environment and to questioning. The majority of TBI is categorized as mild, which is usually more difficult to identify than severe TBI. your mic a little bit closer. I think they're having a problem recording. Let's work on. Okay. In 2007, VA established a system-wide TBI screening and assessment program. All post-9-11 veterans are screened when they access VA for health care. Those who screen positive are then evaluated by a TBI specialist. Between 2007 and 2017, VA screened over 1.1 million veterans and diagnosed over 93,000 of these veterans with a history of, of, of a mild TBI. These veterans then received an individualized rehabilitation plan of care for their specific needs. Individualized rehabilitation treatment plans are paramount to TBI care as these plans consider the impact of symptoms on the veteran's unique functional abilities and are developed with active input from the veteran and their caregiver to develop recovery goals. Of the post 9-11 veterans with a TBI diagnosis, over 70% also have a PTSD diagnosis and over 50% have both a PTSD and a pain diagnosis. This highlights the importance of active integration of mental health and pain care providers when treating individuals with TBI. The complexity of care needed for veterans with TBI and polytrauma is best provided through an integrated medical system, such as VA's polytrauma system of care. This system includes over 100 facilities which provide specialized rehabilitation programs. In the field of brain injuries, VA collaborates with multiple partners to advance care and research by working directly with our veteran service organizations, academic partners, the NFL, the NCAA, and federal agencies such as DOD, NIH, and CDC. VA and DOD have worked together to develop a common definition for TBI. In addition, VA has collaborated with DOD, NIH, and academic partners to develop and implement evidence-based clinical practice guidelines to help both standardize and enhance care. VA continues to invest heavily in TBI-related research. In fiscal year 2017, VA spent over $35 million in TBI research on 164 projects, which includes four research centers and VA's annual $5 million contribution to the VA DOD Chronic Effects of Neurotrauma Consortium, or SENSI. The goal of this research consortium is to better understand the lifetime impacts of military service, particularly combat-associated concussions and their association with mental health disorders, dementia, and related neurodegeneration. VA's research portfolio, coupled with its integrated TBI system of care, provides an optimal setting to better understand TBI and translate these findings to enhance clinical care. Many veteran populations are recognized to be at higher risk for suicide, including those living with a history of TBI. Because military and veteran suicide rates are elevated compared to civilian rates, VA ha has made suicide prevention a top priority. VA offers wide-ranging suicide prevention efforts to identify veterans at great greatest risk, and in July 2017, VA changed its policy to allow urgent mental health treatment for veterans with an other than honorable discharge. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to testify about the importance of TBI diagnosis, treatment, and research. We believe VA is a leader in each of these areas, delivering the best care available to our veterans, and we welcome the opportunity to advance collaboration with our federal and private partners. We also thank the subcommittee and Congress as a whole for their support of getting our veterans the care they have earned and deserve. My colleagues and I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Dr. Sifu. I actually would just be open to answering You're just questions. You're to provide all the answers. Yes, in, yes, in, in the interest of time, sir. <laughs> well, th uh, thank you all for being here. I, you know, I want to jump to uh, uh, something uh, that uh, Dr. Colton uh, we now are going to implement an electronic medical record in the VA that is a, a platform that's already been implemented in the DOD. So I'm, I'm trying to think, and I want to talk a little bit in, in two different buckets. 
One is the concern that I have with people who have received, and I'm glad to hear from Dr. Shulkin that we're, we're, we're helping with crisis intervention with persons with other than honorable discharge. I think that that's, that's good. Um, but how it, it seems to me that on the one hand, looking forward, if we do a better job of uh, whether it's their, their, their MOS, the role that they're playing when they're deployed, where we know that they're going to be exposed to events that could potentially have this cumulative impact that, Elizabeth, that uh, Senator Warren pointed out, it would seem like we should really think through, maybe not in phase one of the EMR, but in subsequent phases, how we capture some of these life events so that we can cumulatively look back and have a high degree of certainty that this person may be suffering from uh, TBI. Uh, does that make sense to you? Absolutely, sir, and I couldn't agree more. You know, I can relate a story. 30 years ago, I was a nuclear engineer on USS Carl Vinson. I wore a dosimeter, um, and every month in my medical record, the amount of radiation that I got was put in my medical record. Now, we had that, re that reactor on Carl Vinson could have killed me. Um, inside of a second, but between occupational protections that I had, medical protections that I had, we reduced the risk to zero. Now, TBI is a much harder problem. Uh, the brain is a considerably more complex organism than just the body as a, as a whole. Blast physics presents a number of challenges. I know when Senator Warren spoke there, we are working on helmets, we are working on things to maybe get the blast wave to go around. Uh, there are many separate things that happen um, when you get a blast or an impact, um, and it's really hard to document those things. That's a very, there's a, there's a, it's a very hard thing to ascertain. So I think for right now, it's very important to get good histories, and that's where our corpsmen and medics come in with our concussion evaluations that discuss what the circumstances were. We also have an obligation as clinicians to get really good histories and document exposures. I'm heartened that the VA is gonna have the same medical record as us, because I've worked in both systems, and I can say it's, it's been very hard over the years to kind of figure out what's going on, or, or the delay has been inordinate. So I'm excited that that's where we are going forward. Yeah, and uh, uh, to any of the, uh, the panelists, uh, I, th I think it was Dr. Dodick that said uh, with, even if you don't have a prior image, so there was about a 95% confidence interval uh, and being able to look at a brain image and uh, reasonably determine that they'd suffered some sort of a, a concussive trauma. Um, is that possibly something we should look at as a way to go back at, uh, at some members uh, who have been uh, uh, other than honorable discharge and say maybe there was something there that we didn't take, uh, take into account? Um, I believe that would, the, the evidence may not be there to support that, that type of implementation at this time. I think the approach right now is to have a no wrong door approach for, for veterans or, or service members with an other than honorable discharge. With, our, with implementation of that policy for um, uh, those individuals that can access for urgent mental health, health needs, during that time, that episode of care can last up to 90 days, during which time we can investigate the, the background, their clinical presentation, and, and determine possibly if their benefit uh, profile should be changed. In addition to that, as part of the chronic effects of neurotrauma consortium, the, the large VA DOD study, we're looking at exactly this issue of dosage, of, of dose effect from brain injury. And we have a validated measure to figure out, did they have prior concussions? Actually, the biggest challenge we have is to find veterans and service members who haven't had a prior concussion in their records. So that's the hardest challenge. But we have a validated metric. So we are recording that. And it's published. And it's, it's, it's standardized. But we're recording that as well as monitoring serial MRI scans, eye tracking scans, all the things the prior panel talked about. What we're trying to do is actually get the knowledge so that if we had that information, we could actually act on it. Because it's scary to know that you've had this dose effect, whether it's from radiation or from brain injuries. What's even more scary is if your clinicians have no clue what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is instead of just thinking we know what to do with it, we're trying to really put some data around that. So, so we're on top of it, and we hope the next time we're able to report in front of you, we'll be able to give you hard evidence on that. Thank you. Senator Gillibrand. Thank you for being here. Um, what is the military doing overall to ensure that it will do a better job in assessing program effectiveness, uns unsung, more evidence-based 
uh, practices, providing appropriate training to providers, and collaborating across the, the services. Because the October report from the Secretary of Defense evaluating the specific tools, processes, and best practices to improve the armed forces identification and treatment of mental health conditions in TBI identified six areas to improve service provision, including a frequent use of evidence-based practices and better specialty certification for providers. I can speak to that, ma'am. We just spent $50 million from CAPE to look at programs for effectiveness. And I think one of the things that we really struggled with was outcomes and fiscal granularity as we looked back. Uh, so going forward, that needs to be a part of the way that we do business. So we created a behavior, a behavioral health data portal that in essence gets outcomes that are in the medical record and will be there for perpetuity. Uh, we also need to make good choices with regard to programs. We need to have a stop doing list. So if a program's not effective, it needs to come off because it's presenting an opportunity cost. And that's something that we need to, we definitely need to focus on going forward. Mm. So I didn't, I didn't feel like you an answered Senator Tillis's question fully in the last question, because he, he's really saying, what are you doing to create an opportunity for someone who may well have been discharged uh, dishonorably because of behavior that is absolutely against the rules, but that would have been caused by uh, traumatic brain injury or PTSD. So specifically, can you address that? Like, what are you doing to protect those service members um, who may well have been punished for inappropriate behavior, uh, but that was actually caused by these diseases? Yes, ma'am. So first, there are opportunities for reclama. So there are boards of correction for military records. The second thing that we implemented was a, an across-the-board look at people who had medical boards stopped for one reason or another, say for disciplinary yep. um, uh, reasons. And we had a physical disability board of review actually look at those, and opposed to like a BCMR where maybe 5% of cases get recharacterized, that board was around 30%. We also wrote special guidance for the boards of correction for military records, secondary to some of Senator Blumenthal's efforts for Vietnam vets and other folks who may have had illnesses before we even had the capability to recognize yeah. this. Really the first good literature about PTSD and TBI and, and really good about uh, post-concussive symptoms and mental health systems that were sustained well beyond having those two things together was in an epidemiological study by Lisa Brenner in 2010 at the Myrick in Denver, one of my VA colleagues. So we're, the science is still nascent, but we really need to protect folks. Um, I think that we've tried to get ahead of the problem in a lot of ways. So now, before we administratively separate someone, we do an evaluation for PTSD and TBI. When I was a resident at Walter Reed in 2000, we would administratively separate people from the emergency room. Um, and in fact, we had about 4,000 administrative separations for mental health issues a year. We've reduced that to 300 mm. now. So that's something, and, and that was a round turn. That happened really quickly in the late 2000s. Great. Um, related, um, many survivors of military sexual trauma suffer from PTSD as a result of that trauma. What is the military doing to diagnose and treat PTSD that results from military sexual trauma? Is their diagnosis and treatment different than the diagnosis and treatment for PTSD caused by a blast injury or other combat activity where there might be co-occurring brain injury? Absolutely. I think that uh, Edna Foa's group at the University of Pennsylvania, I think uh, CPT and prolonged exposures are, uh, prolonged exposure, those are both very good uh, treatments for military sexual trauma. Uh, I think one of the things that I've, I've noticed as a psychiatrist is you can take a person who really didn't have a lot of pre-morbid illness, who didn't have adverse childhood experiences, they can be sexually assaulted and they can just break apart. So as leaders, it's really incumbent upon us to set up a system where, where we're vigilant for, for those types of injuries. Uh, the incidence of sexual harassment and abuse in this nation is horrible. Uh, and in the cohort of patients that I treat, of course, it's much higher. Uh, so we need, to be, we need to be really focused on access to care for that group, 
meeting patients where they are, uh, and the ability of confidential care. For instance, a service member can actually walk into a VA vet center and get treatment for military sexual trauma. Um, but as a clinician who's actually writing things in the record, I also need to be sensitive to that patient's needs. I don't need to be writing details about what's going on, nor do I have to have a close contact with command. I need to be focused on that patient's needs and making that patient better. I appreciate that. Can I ask a follow-up? Um, so to Dr. Um, Shulton and Dr. Sifu, please describe the VA programs that have been developed to diagnose and treat military sexual trauma-induced PTSD in veterans seeking treatment for TBI, and are we doing enough? Uh, thank you for that question. So VA has um, an extensive military sexual trauma program and uh, implementation of screening at all VA medical centers. Uh, we screen every veteran accessing VA for care for military sexual trauma. Actually, the, the screening rate was 98.7% in fiscal year 16. But can you do it from the other end? Like, if someone comes in for PTSD, do you check that it might be not a blast, but actually trauma? Meaning, they don't come in for tr sexual trauma, they come in for PTSD. Right, exactly. So. so Right, and that's a good point because military sexual trauma isn't a diagnosis, it's an experience. And so they're screened for the, the diagnosis as well as the experience and then their individual treatment plan is based upon their symptomatology and their presentation. Um, and in addition, VA has a, a, a large research portfolio trying to better understand the impact of military sexual trauma and its effect on associated mental health conditions. And importantly, if, if they're, you know, so if they, they come in, they get screened, for example, for a TBI, they're also going to be screened for the PTSD diagnosis. And that PTSD diagnosis could be due to military sexual trauma. The beauty of the integration of the, the VA system across every VA is that the team doesn't just treat TBI or PTSD from a blast or a depression. The, the team is set up to treat all the diagnoses within the same setting, with the same core of providers. That's a huge difference. Nobody wants to come back three days later or go to another setting. Exactly. And so, so we're very aware that there are unique, you know, each patient's unique, but we're doing it within the same team context, you know, what used to be called a medical home, but we're doing it within primary cares involved, but the specialists are too. So, you know, each diagnosis is vitally important, but military sexual trauma is, is, it has uniqueness to it, but that's also handled in the same setting. Which, which we think is an advantage you know, across the U.S. Thank you very much. Uh, just one final question for, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Colston. Uh, Dr. Colston, you, when you were describing your experience working near a reactor, the, the beauty of that is you knew where it was and you had precise measurement devices to, to make sure that you were in a, in a safe environment. Um, it seems, is there any work being done to, again, look at the, the MOSs of, uh, or, the, or the, the task? Let's say that you're in artillery or you're in various conditions where, again, this, the, the cumulative impact that we were talking about is something that I haven't spent a lot of time studying, and I will, but any way to where we could, you know, reasonably predict that, uh, that, that some people need to be tested or, or we have to provide research just based on the nature, until we have helmets that can deflect the waves and do the sorts of things to minimize the injury. Or is there any research being done on NDOD in that light? Yes, sir. In fact, uh, I, was speaking to I was speaking to my colleague, Dr. Bennett, who's in the audience at the Office of Naval Research yesterday about a lot of the work that's being done around blast physics and uh, an attempt to ascertain what, any, what happens with any particular blast. <laughs> Uh, you shoot a 50 cal, that's about a half PSI pressure wave. A breacher is seeing maybe two PSI, but a breacher may see four or 500 of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then certainly an IED can be something much higher than 10 or 15. Um, we're very worried about what we see downstream. Dr. Pearl at the Uniformed Services University has seen a very, almost a pathognomonic lesion associated with blast injury. Now, there's a lot of crossover in between lesions that we see in the brain, but this particular lesion was at density junctions. In other words, right where you would deposit injury from a blast wave. And a blast wave isn't just running 25,000 feet a second through the brain. 
brain. There's also a coup contra coup injury where your brain's sloshing around in your skull and obviously fragments. So there's all kinds of work to do in the research realm that we're working on assiduously uh, and we need to do it fast because certainly the next, the next battle's out there. Well, I want to uh, thank all the panelists uh, from first and second panel for being here. I think this has been a very informative uh, hearing, and it's one that we need to focus a lot of attention on. I think we've all highlighted our concern prospectively for men and women serving in, uni in uniform, but also for the veterans. So I, I thank you all for your testimony and your time here today. Um, we will uh, hold the hearing or hold the uh, committee record open for uh, through the end of. Uh, business tomorrow uh, so that you can submit any other information. We may also submit some questions for the record and other members will be allowed to do the same. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your service to our veterans and our men and women in uniform. This committee is adjourned.